Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. They were building positions in there if for a fight. If anyone to us, by the time anyone got to us, I think it was the weather was so bad, there would be nobody there. The and the next thing I hear was alarms screaming. The chances of survival were very, very steep. The soldiers didn't want to go into the ambushes, so they'd send the That's kids in first. So he was sent in first into an ambush and he got shot in the stomach. It was very hard for me, very hard for my family. And the pain burst. I'm proud of the pain. crew. Of what I've achieved and what I'm doing. To volunteer for service was in effect to put your life on the line. Today we spoke with Vietnam veteran David Buckwalter. David served in Vietnam in 1966 to 67 and he was a signaller. Welcome to Life on the Line. I'm Alex Lloyd and I'm speaking today with David Buckwalter. Thanks for coming on the podcast, David. No problem. David, you were born in 1945. What was it like growing up with World War II in the raw and very recent past? I don't have a great recollection of soldiers and, you know, when I was growing up, uh, I didn't even know what my father, what his involvement was until many years later. I didn't know that my grandfather had been in the First World War well after he died. Life was very easy going in those days, a lot simpler than it is today. And the conflict wasn't spoken about much? No, not at all. What was your father's experience in World War II? Well, he, did, he wasn't a soldier. He, he worked for Defence Industries. He was a tool maker, so he was involved in the manufacture of uh, machines to make defence equipment. And what was your grandfather's experience in World War I? Well, my grandfather immigrated to Australia after the Second World War. From Germany. My grandfather had left Germany in about 1910 or 1905 or something and gone to uh, the United States, immigrated to the United States where a number of his family had immigrated to. And when the First World War broke out, like all good Germans, he decided to go home and uh, fight for the fatherland. Answered the call. He was awarded an Iron Cross and wounded in action. I never found that out until long after he, long after I'd served in the Defence Force. So he emigrated to Australia after World War II. Was yeah. he involved in the Second World War as well? No. I wear his uh, medals on Anzac Day. That's an interesting mix there. I used to carry them in my pocket and then one day I was having lunch with some of my mates and I talked to them a bit about it. And I told them I'd been wearing my grandfather's Iron Cross and they were carrying it in my pocket. And I said I was coming up for the 100th anniversary of Anzac Day and I said, I'm, I'm thinking about wearing, wearing his Iron Cross and his other medals. And they encouraged me to do so, and I did. Well, he served his country and with distinction. Well, the thing is, soldiers are just pawns. We don't have political opinions. We might have them, but they're... So, you know, they fought an honourable war. So your first exposure to military life yourself is then through cadets? Cadets at school, yes. Can you share with me some of those experiences? Well, I was in the cadets from uh, second year in high school, something like that. I was in the Q store. I was in the brass band. We went to Singleton on uh, training exercises. And in those days, the cadets had weapons. So every soldier was issued with a 303. When we were up at Singleton, we used to fire those weapons, including Vickers machine guns, Bren guns, things that the kids guys don't do today. I imagine that was good for uh, team spirit and teamwork and that kind of thing. Definitely was, yeah. And we still had the pipe band. Jock McConnell had uh, established that. Tony Gifford was in charge of the cadets for many years. This is at Knox Grammar. Yes, at Knox Grammar, yes. Yeah, I, I, I have you know good recollections of the time in the cadets. You graduate from school in 1963. What did you do with yourself after? Uh, I wanted to be a photographer and uh, I'd uh, started doing photography when I was about 12 with another friend of mine. We used to do a lot of motorsport photography. I tried to get into that once I left school, but there wasn't, there wasn't much happening and uh, 
My father encouraged me to get into a more commercialised uh, job and uh, I ended up as a manager trainee at Woolworths but uh, after about a year I didn't like it, couldn't like it so I left. I got a job working with a photographer for nothing, just work experience. Things changed and I managed to get a job, a real job in Melbourne and I went to RMIT down there and studied photography two nights a week and uh, continued on with the sporting photography. Used to do a lot of work with um, Footy Week down there, which was a local a magazine that covered the then VFL. Still doing a bit of motor racing photography, which I'd been doing with my friend here in Sydney. Then the government came along and offered me a job that I couldn't refuse. Literally? Yes. So you're part of the first National Service call-up in 1965? Yes, I was, yep. Do you recall how you felt at the time about being called up? Not in detail, but I don't have any bad recollections of it. You know, I was uh, working as a photographer, wasn't going anywhere particularly dynamically, so I don't think it really bothered me that much. And of course, we didn't have a clue what it was all about anyway. What corps did you apply for upon being called up? The process was that you did recruit training, everybody did the same thing. After recruit training, you were given the opportunity to select a corps in theory. I wanted to get into public relations because of the photography and they said uh, if I was a journalist they'd have room but they didn't have any room for photographers. As it turned out they most certainly did have room for photographers. It was not very well covered from that point of view. And then they suggested that I could do photography in intelligence so I could join the intelligence corps. And I said, well, okay, I'll join the intelligence corps. And I said, well, you can't do that until you've been in the army for about 18 months because of security reasons. But your best way into intelligence is through infantry intelligence. So join the infantry intelligence section you can use some of photography and then transfer to over to intelligence later on. It sounds like a nice bit of acrobatics just to get you to become another infantryman. I never saw any intelligence or anybody intelligent in the, in the, in the infantry. <laughs> Where were you trained up at? At Wagga Wagga, Kapuka Base. And how was that? Yeah, hard. You had um, a platoon sergeant that just try and make your life miserable. They would instill into you the the makings of team effort, which you didn't realise at the time. So when something was done wrong by some individual, the individual never got punished. It was always the unit that got punished. You learnt very quickly. You never dobbed any, anybody in and you never owned up. After your recruit training, you also specialise in becoming a signaller among the infantry. Yeah, well, that, that was, uh, again, a, a process of, uh, of luck, I suppose. I was transferred to um, do my infantry training with uh, 3 RAR, uh, 3 Royal Australian Regiment, in Woodside, South Australia, which is up in the hills. After core training, as it's referred to, we learn how to be an infantry soldier. We were given opportunities to do various specialties, if you like. They called for volunteers to do specialist courses and uh, there was an opportunity to be a, a signaller, a mortar platoon guy or a pioneer, which are engineers, explosives, mines and that sort of stuff. I thought SIGs might be a good idea. You get to hear what was going on and um, the big advantage was that the SIG course was in Sydney at Holsworthy and uh, so I was getting to go home, see a few of my mates and, and the family. So, yeah, I transferred to Sydney. We did this course, which went for three months. SIGS has its advantages. As I said earlier, you do get to know what's going on around the place. On the other hand, you um, might be hanging on to about 30 kilos of radio and batteries. Everybody might have a different allocation of equipment to carry, depending on what they were doing. Each section of infantry uh, has 10 guys in it as a machine gunner in the section. And he would carry a machine gun, which most probably weighs around 20 kilos in itself, and he'd carry most probably 200 rounds of ammunition for the gun. Most soldiers in the, in the section would also carry a couple of hundred rounds for the machine gun in bandoliers, plus their ammunition for their own weapon. Four days rations, grenades and mines with a sort of general paraphernalia used to maybe carry um, half a dozen water bottles so about six kilos there as a radio operator um, ANP 
RC25, set weighed 25 kilos. It's a couple of spare batteries. What are the dimensions of this? 300 by 150 by oh, around about 300 again. Millimetres, yeah. Yeah. So you carry that, so you still have to carry, as a SIG, you still have to carry a rifle and 200 rounds of ammunition, four days rations. And when do you finally find yourself in Vietnam? We arrived on in um, Vietnam on the 16th of August, 1966, based at Nui Dat Base. The opening salvo came on the first night. I was with other guys that had come over together with me, other guys from 3RAR, another guy named Peter Erickson who um, ended up as a mortar platoon man. We were sharing the tent together and we were right next door to the artillery. The artillery used to fire off indiscriminate round firing on a regular basis into areas where Vietnamese were supposedly not to be. The objective was to keep them on their toes. Of course, we didn't know anything about that. And uh, suddenly the artillery's going off right next to us and had a couple of scared little boys. <laughs> the following night, the uh, task force was mortared. We didn't move because we thought there was more of these artillery tasks. But then the SIG sergeant came running around and said, everybody in the pits, we're being mortared. We scored eight rounds into the camp that night. A couple of guys were wounded. The next day was the start of the lead up to the Battle of Long Tan. Before we get to that, how much protection do these pits offer you, though? Nothing if you get a direct hit. <laughs> if they're dug properly, they you know. Cover you from shrapnel yeah, and that. Yeah, up to shoulder height, basically. You've got to be able to be able to see what's be out and beyond and be able to fire at something. So a bit below the shoulder height. Yeah, I was transferred to 6RAR the next day after that, went to battalion headquarters in the SIG command post, basically. The battalion SIG? Yeah. The SIG platoon doesn't just operate radios. They run a, a, a telephone system, which uh, was in those days pretty antique compared to what most people would know today. You know, we used to lay the cable. They were the same sort of thing as leftovers from previous wars. <laughs> they had a plug-in switchboard with cables that used to connect an incoming line to an outgoing line or vice versa. And uh, you had a set of headphones and you sat at a desk and watched lights flashing at you and you'd pick up an incoming call and they'd tell you who they wanted to speak to and you'd put them through and collect two lines together, basically. That was my initial start there. Talk me through Long Tan. Yeah, Long Tan, um, the commanding officer sent out company patrol, company size patrol, the following day to try and find the mortar base. So uh, they have uh, mechanisms to trace incoming rounds and uh, so they can get a general direction of where it came from. And so they sent out patrols looking for that. The patrols found wounded bandages and stuff because our artillery had returned fire at, on the night. They found radio cables, telephone cables that were cut and severed and then they came back in and swapped over and Delta Company took over from Alpha Company and Bravo Company. Early in the afternoon they um, ran into two or three guys, chased them as the lead platoon and the rest is history. They ran into a more or less a brigade size organisation. There were about two and a half thousand Vietnamese soldiers against a company of 110 infantry soldiers. The irony was that this, that morning the army had brought in entertainers from Australia, people that uh, are not on the radar these days, but Little Paddy and uh, Cold Joy and the Joy Boys, and, um, and it was bucketing with rain. I still have photographs of guys sitting there in their raincoats when he watching this show with a background of firing going on, which was only a couple of k's away. Where'd you go after Long Tan? Well, it was only a matter of, uh, uh, I think, maybe a week or less, and I was transferred to Alpha Company. So I became the company commander's local network operator. So the company commander has two radio operators, one on the company network, 
talking to the three platoons that he has under his command and one connected to the uh, battalion network where he can talk to all the other companies. So there are two of us operating there and we travel with the company commander on a well, company operation. Can you share with me some of the operations you undertook? with that company? Well, uh, yeah, it, uh, it gets a little bit blurred after a while. The kind of thing is sort of continuous. So we're out outside the wire, as it's known, known as, more or less continuously in, in varying different size patrols. Sometimes we, you know, we'd, we'd walk out of the wire. Uh, other times we'd be transported out by um, personnel carriers. Uh, and other times we'd be helicoptered out or we could walk out and get picked up somewhere or by helicopters or APCs and move to another location depending on what the uh, operation was designed to achieve. They all have a lot of similarity to them, so it's all quiet. There's not much sound. Nobody does any talking except maybe when we're harbour up, have a break, have a morning tea or a lunch or something like that or harbour up for the night. They're not doing too much talking unless the radio operations required. On the company network, patrols would be out in front. Platoon commanders may create, have a sighting, create a sighting, so they'd want to report back to the company commander what, what they'd seen, what was going on, what the terrain was like, if there were any you know, creeks and rivers they had to cross or something or anything at all. So they'd call me up and then I'd grab the, the OC, officer commanding, hand in the handset and say it's uh, Sunray 2 platoon or Sunray 1 platoon, hand him the thing and he'd discuss whatever he wanted to discuss with him. When you weren't on duty, what was life like at the base? You were hardly ever not on duty. You might spend six days in camp in a month. The rest of the time you'd be out on patrol. Sometimes it was a standing patrol about a thousand metres out. Other times it was a platoon-sized patrol. You'd go out a short, you know, still a short, relatively short distance, maybe you know, three or four k's. So when you're not working, you're sleeping basically. That's it. Yeah, and if you were in camp, each platoon had a machine gun down near the wire. Everybody had to take it in turns manning it, two hours on, four hours off. We did have a boozer for a limited amount of time, maybe about uh, two hours, I think. Doesn't sound long enough. No, it wasn't. We still managed to hook a few in. In your patrols, did you ever go into villages and interact with the locals? Yes. And how could you ever tell if they were the enemy? You would have had no idea if they were secretly Viet Cong. That's true. They were. We had a situation where we there was a village uh, not far from Nui Dat that was known to be harbouring VC. Head office decided that they were going to move everybody out of the village. It was riddled with tunnels underneath and everything. So we went in one night, two in the morning or something, surrounded the place and it Sunrise, we went in and had the whole village cordoned off and they moved the whole, the whole village out of there, sent them to a new home. In December, we were on an operation which we went through an area where um, there was a different variety of mosquitoes around. Even though we were taking anti-malarial pills, a lot of people got malaria, including me. I was training to play the Kiwis rugby when we got back. I went down on the train on the dirt patch we had as what we call an oval and uh, went to the uh, regimental aid post, the RAP, and... Uh, Senior medic took one look at me and said, you've got malaria. I'm shipping you down to Vung Tao to hospital. And unfortunately, that meant that I had to be replaced as the company commander SIG. So when I came back, they wanted to send me back to battalion headquarters. I was, technically, I was part of SIG platoon, not A company. So I uh, requested a transfer. I said, look, I, you know, I want to stay in A company. I don't know all the guys here. So that was accepted and I went to three per turn. It's a regular digger. Did Alpha Company fall under heavy fire at any stage while you were attached to it? Numerous contacts over a period of time. Operation Bribey in February of 67 where we were helicoptered into a rice paddy looking for a unit of VC who had raided a local uh, Arvin, that's a South Vietnamese army base, in the last day or two. Unfortunately, um, we didn't know where they were. We were out there to find them, but they were in the bush just off the edge of the rice paddy that we had landed in. So we came under fire instantly after we landed in the helicopters and... That remained all day. 
Yeah, well, the recollection, I suppose, is that we sat around on Luscombe Field, which was the um, airstrip at Nui Dat, where the company of uh, American helicopters that could move the whole 100 guys in one hit. We sat there for hours waiting for the call, and then eventually the call came, and we jumped in the helicopters, and off we go. We arrive on the scene, the... um, there are uh, gunships attached to the slicks that carried all the troops. They've opened up on the whole area. The gunner next to me. I usually sat on the floor when I the helicopter. There wasn't enough room in one of these helicopters for everybody to get a seat, basically. Usually two blokes sat on the floor. Your feet out on the running boards uh, down below, so you just top straight off, but you're parked right next door to the door gunner who was firing his weapon as we were coming in and said, anybody gets hit, get back in the helicopter, which my machine gunner and I discussed afterwards, uh, how was that going to happen if we'd got hit? So, you know, we got off the helicopters and ran to the perimeter of the bush and the rest of the day was uh, taken up firing and getting fired upon, basically. Airstrikes, artillery, mortars, and on all day. And how did it end? Did the Viet Cong retreat? Yes, they did, but not before um, we lost a lot of casualties. Two platoon in our company took about 15 casualties, I think it was. Bravo company, who came in second after us and came in on the opposite flank, lost eight guys that day and quite a few wounded. How many friends did you lose over the course of your tour? on the whole tour. It was right at the end and he was killed by a mine and he walked across a roadway to get a, c- a light of a cigarette. Peter Arnold uh, had been with three battalion with me and he went to Bravo Company. He was killed that, on that Operation Drivey. Yeah, I was uh, detailed to carry the bodies out on the following day after the battle. Peter was one of them. So, David, because you're working in such high-stress conditions, I can't even imagine, how much time off does the Army give you guys? Well, setting aside the day here and the day there in camp when you weren't out on patrol, pretty well everybody got three days R&C, as it was called, rest and convalescence down at Vung Tau, which was the logistical base where all the, everything came in and out of the country. Down there was a beach resort, there were bars, countless places where you could go and get pretty well hammered, which most blokes did. The bars were frequented by the local girls. You used to have to buy them Saigon tea, as it was called, which was meant to be a glass of whiskey, but in effect it was tea. Guys used to get involved with the girls, of course. We had about three days down there at a time uh, where we could goof off, basically. So you had a nice three days to vent and decompress. Yeah. Uh, setting aside that, everybody had seven days of R&R. You had a choice of places to go to, uh, Singapore, uh, Bangkok and uh, Hong Kong. And, and I went to Hong Kong. So r and is leave in country, R&R is leave out of country. Correct, yeah. And how was Hong Kong? Well, I'm a bit similar to the RNC, I suppose, you know. Um, don't remember too much of it then. Don't remember too much of it, yeah. Tell me about the cooking. When we knew that we were going down to the horseshoe, they told us that we were going to be on patrol packs, 24-hour packs, which aren't the same as eating in the mess in the back at camp. I had a guy named Peter Bennett. He was the platoon gunner. Really loved his tucker. So him and I did a raid on the mess the night before we were helicoptered out there. We took uh, about six dozen eggs, blocks of cheese and ham and a fry pan and an extra tent and anything we could lay our hands on. We managed to get to the horseshoe with only a loss of one egg. The next morning the boys were out opening their tins of ham and lima beans and other horrible delicacies and uh, Bennett and Buckwalter were making ham omelettes. You were the real hero that day. Yeah. So eventually we got 11-man ration packs out. The commander came to me and said, how about doing the cooking. I said, I'll do the cooking, no patrols, no work parties, just do the cooking. So we eventually got the stoves out from the, from the base camp. We got two guys to go back to Nui Dat on a, a little mini R&C in and out for the day, go and have a couple of beers, catch up with a few mates. They were always giving us a grocery list. We were on two cans of man out there. We had bottles of Bundy and you name it out there coming in every day and uh, sides of ham and stuff. Nice gig to land yourself for your yeah. final few weeks of tour. Yeah. And then, David, things do get serious again, and we come to the 2nd of May, 1967. What happened that day? 
in April, our company was delegated to do security patrols for engineers that had been delegated to create a minefield designed to restrict the movement of the VC. It was about 10 k's long and eventually had something in the order of 40,000 mines. The engineers uh, working in the minefield all day, every day, laying mines. Our job was to uh, do patrols along the fence that was created, two fences to create the minefield. So every day, patrol from each platoon would go out and search the area. The location uh, that we were based at out there was uh, known as the Horseshoe Fire Support Base. So a fire support base is a location that's normally outside or on the fringe of the range of the artillery at base camp Nui Dat. And the general operational requirements were that patrols would always be in range of artillery. So if they went outside that range, we had to move artillery out to a fire support base. And the fire support base needed to be protected by infantry as well. And that's what the Horseshoe base was all about. The Horseshoe was an old volcano that had had the back blown out of it. And so it was in the shape of a horseshoe. So it was a hill on a fairly arid plain, which gave you observation for miles and miles. We built it into a fortress. So we had lots of barbed wire around the place, lots of claymore mines set up around the place, big heavy concrete gun pits with heavy calibre, 50 calibre machine guns. Each platoon were around the top of the ridge of that horseshoe. Four platoons out there, so we had the three from Alpha Company and we had one from D Company. Every day, two sections of three of each platoon would go out and do one of these patrols. So um, I had recently did the first a first aid course because I was endeavouring to get a, a higher pay grouping which required me to have certain features. Think, uh, Skill sets? Yeah. And how much of your time left in Vietnam do you have at this point? We only had about a month and a half. month and a half ago, okay. We left on the 14th of June. On the 2nd of May, the, um, the platoon had two sections out on patrol. So one section from each platoon remained at base camp to secure the, the artillery. Engineers are out laying mines and they had a rotation. We had a battery of artillery at the fire support base. That day they had made a change to rotate the batteries. So one would leave and the other one would come back in. We received the um, American uh, 135th battery, which was a mechanised battery, like a big tank. So when they arrived, they performed the normal functions of what artillery guys do when they get to a base they secure their guns put sandbags around them so forth to give them protection from incoming before the minefield had started to be built they built a um, a, a small minefield around the horseshoe itself before that was started there was an artillery plate gun emplacement which was now inside the minefield for reasons uh, that i can't explain. Some of these American gunners didn't get the information that there was a minefield very close handy to them, even though it, it was marked with traditional skull and crossbone markings. This gunner, PFC Pardo, saw the old gun emplacement sandbags and timbers and stuff and decided to duck under this two-strand wire fence and go and get himself some sandbags rather than uh, fill up some new ones. He trod on the centre mine of the first cluster of mines inside the minefield. I was with three other guys having a bit of a smoke go and shooting the breeze, basically, as I said. And uh, so we could see what was going on. I was also doing a bit of cooking. And uh, my normal garb was thongs, shorts and a hat. When the mine went off, that's what I had on. I went in and grabbed the medical pack, which I knew I was the only one at the horseshoe on the day that had a medical pack. Everybody else was out on patrol. I ran down the hill, looked what was happening inside the minefield. There was some bits and pieces of timber lying around. By the time I got there, I was in bare feet and lost the thongs. Walked in on the timbers and started treating PFC Pardo. 
who was severely wounded. What were the nature of his wounds? Well, his bottom half of his one leg was just hanging off there, plus numerous other shrapnel wounds. My job was to secure his wounds, basically, and strap his leg together, act like a splint. Shortly after I started, Sapper Neil Innes, one of the engineers who was in his lines down on the base of the hill, who had been testing fuses on mines, came into the minefield and uh, assisted me. He had the... Uh, the, the disadvantage of uh, knowing what, you know, what, what was the danger. As an infantry soldier, we had not been given any training, so we just knew there were mines in there which weren't nice, and uh, he knew where they were because he'd laid the mines. So when he came alongside me, he pointed out the other mines in the cluster which were inches away, and then he assisted me by holding the gunners hands under his belt to stop him waving around and setting off another mine. He'd already touched one of the mines but hadn't been sufficient pressure to detonate it. He was in a lot of pain. Yeah, morphine, lots of shell dressings as they were known as. Eventually we got a stretcher passed in and passed him out to a waiting helicopter who had been called. Off he goes. He did lose his leg. But he lived. Mm. He lost his leg and um, his uh, gunner, gunner sergeant, who was just outside the wire when the explosion went off, had caught one in the heart and died very quickly. Well, you saved one life that day, David. Saved one life that day, yeah. What was it like coming back home, the reception from the public? Well, I think we were very lucky. Uh, apart from one RAR, which was the regular army battalion that had come back from uh, Benoit but, and been attached to the Americans, we were the first two battalions to come home, five and six. Five was the other battalion that was located at Nui Dat at the same time as us. We were the first two to come home. They came home a few weeks ahead of us. So uh, when we arrived on HMAS Sydney, we had a triumphant march through Brisbane. Streets were lined like on Anzac Day and we got a good reception. It was never, there wasn't any, any negative or anti. That came a bit later during the war. Yeah, it did. You know, within a year it was on. We, got, we went back to Inagra Barracks, got paid out and said, thanks for your two years, see you later. Transport out to the airport, caught a plane back to Sydney and never saw him again for years. All, the, all those mates I had. Did you eventually get back in touch with them? The catalyst was, was when it was decided to have a welcome home parade, which was 20 years later. And, I mean, some of us used to ring each other occasionally. We were spread out all over the country. When we had the 87 parade, in, which was in Sydney, well, yeah, it's uh, pretty emotional still today. The government did the right thing and they flew everybody in. They came in, C-130 Herx from all over the country, civilian airlines, however they could get them there. And we virtually had everybody there. It's a powerful memory for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've marched on Anzac Day since then as well. Yeah, I don't think I've missed an Anzac Day. Well, it was great to have the politicians looking after you guys, recognising your service and treating you right for the mistakes of politicians some 20 years prior. Yeah, it was. Unfortunately, the politicians that recognised us in 87 weren't the same politicians that recognised us earlier on. You know, our government has a justifiable policy, I suppose, of following America because of our World War II history. The UK let us down badly in Singapore and uh, we needed to get somebody else to fend for, help fend for us. And uh, the Americans came to the rescue, basically, in the Battle of the Coral Sea. Otherwise, that war most probably would have been somewhat different. But unfortunately, when you look at Vietnam, the war became a political war. People say, we lost the war. I had a personal argument with a, a friend of mine who I was away with in America and one of my other friends who I was away with me, also an ex-Vietnam veteran, and this guy says, we lost the war. Well, my friend and I both got up and took severe umbrage. We didn't lose any war. The governments lost the war in the political forum. Governments wouldn't let us fight like soldiers. The government wouldn't let us cross the DMZ to 
crossover into Hanoi. You know, World War II came along. We landed on the coast of France and we walked all the way to Berlin until we stopped Hitler. They wouldn't let us do that. All we did every day, this is every soldier that was in Vietnam, went out on patrol for one reason only. We weren't out there to take country. We were out there to kill people. That was our job. The irony of it is, you know, we'd go out there, we'd have a contact, and you can say almost without fail that we won every battle that we went into, but we then had to withdraw to base camp and the enemy came back to where we just fought him and took, took back over the land that was in. It was unwinnable, and what the Americans wanted to do was to try to bomb them into submission, whether it be by massive infantry soldier battles or whether it was B-52s. If you're in a country and you've got nowhere else to go, you'll defend it to the last man, and they did. So when you look at the history of that, President Kennedy, when he, when he was a sen- senator, arrived in Vietnam in 1951, was talking to his national security advisers there. They all advised him that there was no chance of winning that war. And he went back to America with the objective of not sending a full lot of troops. Unfortunately, we know the result of that. He was killed. And the next day, Lyndon Johnson turned around and... All the way with LPJ. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, the, the political nature of it. It's one of the most complex wars in our history in that sense. You've been reflecting a lot on your time in Vietnam lately, giving talks at schools and that kind of thing. How do you look back on your time in Vietnam today? How do I look back on it? In terms of... Your personal experience, how it affected you, how it shaped your life going forward. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's a difficult thing. Um, I think the issue is that when you're much younger, you're away working, trying to establish a business, maybe a family. You're busy. You're occupied all the time. You don't think as much about the past as you do about now. But when you get closer to retirement and you don't have as much to engage yourself with, then you do start reflecting on on your time in the service. You never forgot about it every single day of your life. From the day you heard the first shot coming your way, you, you're going to remember that. That's the way it is. Looking back on it when doing something like a school project, doing this interview, it's difficult. You have to dig into things that you don't want to remember or you want to try and keep in the, the background. But it's important that people understand it. Well, thank you for digging it up and sharing it with me today, David. I really appreciate it and it's been an honour to have you come and tell me your story. Thanks for speaking with me. Although David did not get to be deployed to Vietnam as a photographer, he did take a camera with him. If you go to the Australian War Memorial website and type in David Buckwalter, you'll see an array of his incredible photos that he took. David also has a website in regards to his service and the minefield incident, dmbuckwalter.com. If you like the episode, please leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes to help us reach more people with the podcast and to spread these amazing stories. Reach out to us on Twitter at LOTLpod and on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast. You can find out more about us and this podcast at www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com and you can write to us at podcast at lifeonthelinepodcast.com. And if you know a veteran serviceman or servicewoman with a story to tell, please get in touch. We would love to have them on the podcast. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget.